again because we really missed the fellowship of being with other Christian folks. And we started the search anew. And again, we kept finding churches, nah, this isn't quite right, this isn't quite right. So we thought, well, we need to expand our search geographically. And we began to go out further from our home and further from our home. And finally, we got all the way to Sun City, a long ways away. That's only a 20-minute drive from home. Seriously, it's not that far. But we were so happy to find Inspire Church. First day we came in, we heard the attributes that Pastor Brian just talked about. Pastor Jim said the same thing, that we're a place that's casual, we're contemporary, and we're Bible-centered. And this is the one that, as a retired pastor, this is the one that's the most important to me, quite honestly. And I was thrilled to hear that. And indeed, Pastor Jim is a solid, excellent Bible teacher. And so I've been loving it. We've been loving it every week as we've been coming, especially enjoying his current series on encounters with Jesus. You know, all these times when people encounter Jesus in the Bible and how their lives were almost immediately changed. Sometimes even their names were changed, you know, Levi to Matthew and so forth, many others in the Bible, these changes in life. So my big question for all of us this morning is this, have you encountered Jesus? Have you had that Jesus encounter? You know, every life is a spiritual journey. One of the things that used to kind of drive me crazy when I was a pastor, I'd meet with new people that came to the church for the first time, and I'd ask them about their spiritual journey. You know, where, where are you with Christ? And very often people would say to me, well, I was born a Christian. I'd say, really? How does that happen? Well, you know, my parents were Christians, or my parents always took me to church. Or I would, well, no, that's more than, no more than you know, walking into a garage and you become a car. I mean, that just doesn't work, right? I mean, I'm sorry, it doesn't. So everybody has a spiritual journey, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about mine this morning, and I want to, instead of talking about somebody else in the Bible who encountered Jesus, because I don't know where Pastor Jim is going with his series, and I don't want to start talking about someone that he's going to talk about, so I thought instead I'd share about somebody I know the best, me. So I want to share you, if you don't mind, my own story. For a couple of reasons, I, I always like to know something about the person that's standing up and talking to me, and so I wanted to have a chance to do that this morning, but also hoping that maybe this will resonate with you, either remembering your initial encounter with Jesus, or if you haven't had that, if you've sit, sitting here saying, I, I don't even know what that's about, maybe it'll intrigue you enough to say, okay, I want to know how that happens. So let me start with sharing some of my background with you. I was born in Alaska. My dad was a bush pilot back in the crazy days of the 40s and the 50s. And unfortunately, flying was very dangerous back then, and my father lost his life in a plane crash trying to rescue another. He did rescue another family. I was five years old. My three younger sisters were four, two, and six months. My mom was widowed at the age of 28 with four little kids. She never remarried. She just dedicated herself to raising us kids. So we moved to southern Idaho, a little farming community where my grandpa lived, and it was excellent for me as a, as a boy growing up in this little town, and my grandpa was handy, and my mom insisted that we go to church. Now, it was one of those towns, you know, little rural community. Very often, you know, they have a center park in the middle of the town. We had that, and every corner of the park had a church all the different ones, right? And so we went to a little Methodist church there. My mom was a typist. She was a secretary, and so she did the church bulletin every week. And I remember being every Saturday down in the basement of the church running, at that time to me, a big mimeograph machine, right, running off all the bulletins. I think I still had the blue ink on my fingers, you know. They're still in there somewhere. And I was a bell ringer, and I did all kinds of things at the church, had a great time. The pastor was special to me because he had four little girls and he always wanted a son. So he said, you're mine. And he would take me to all the, the father-son events, you know, the breakfast and all that kind of thing. I had a good friend, uh, one of my best friends also was fatherless and so he adopted him as well and we all partnered together and it was special. 
When I got to sixth grade, my mom moved us to the San Diego area. She had lived there at one point and wanted to go back because better work opportunities for her, better education at that time for us kids. And so we moved there in sixth grade, and we started to attend a new Methodist church that was nearby, and it was much, much larger. Big church, much different than what I was used to. And my mom insisted we go, and, and unfortunately, one of those things occurred that, you know, these things happen in church sometime, this committee of women came to visit with my mom, and she got sideways with them. They said some things that were really troubling, they kind of interfered in her life, ways she should be raising her kids, all those kinds of things, and she just didn't take well to that. And so she said, that's it, I'm done with you, we're not going. Now, as an 11-year-old, I'm like... Ah, don't have to go to church, yay, right? And so Sunday morning came, and it was on my bedroom door, and my mom's there, and I said, yeah, and she goes, get up, get ready for church. I said, Mom, I thought we weren't going. She said, you are. <laughs> and so I had to walk to church, you know, towing my three little sisters with me. Now, they were much sneakier than I was at that time, and, and so they snuck off to their friends' homes and, you know, spent the morning with them doing whatever, playing games, watching TV, whatever it was, but I went to church. I was a rule follower. I didn't know what else to do. I thought, I'm supposed to go to church, I'll go to church. And it wasn't long before I became an acolyte, you know, would do the lighting of the candles thing, and so I very often sat up on the platform with the pastor, and I heard lots and lots of sermons. I became an usher. I actually ended up working in the church through high school as a, as a custodian and gardener assistant, and so I did all those jobs after school there. So I was at the church pretty much seven days a week, and there was only one problem. I was not a Christian. I learned lots of Bible stories. I heard a lot of wonderful stories. I loved our pastors. They were wonderful, wonderful men. One of them ended up marrying Joy and I years later heard lots of sermons, and it was my failing, not theirs, that I didn't get the connection. I thought God was just out there somewhere. I, it's not that I didn't believe in him. I just thought he kind of spun off the world and said, good luck to y'all, love ya. <laughs> you. Know, have a good time. And that was it. But I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I didn't really get that. And so when I got to college, I have a strongly atheist roommate and he destroyed my weak faith almost immediately. It was easy. I didn't have much defense. And so he challenged me, and, you know, I just kind of walked away. I didn't do anything with church for a number of years. I worked my way through college, San Diego State. Go Aztecs. Anybody? <laughs> no? Okay. Solo Aztec here today. Oh, well. But I worked my way through college, and uh, I'd intended to become a teacher, but by the time I finished college, you had to go another year to get a credential, and I was, you know, tired of being flat broke. So where I'd worked through college was through a distribution center, warehousing, and they offered me a management position right away, paying a lot more than teachers, which is just wrong. <laughs> teachers should be making a lot more, right? And... But I, I received this, uh, this position. I ended up in management. I managed this distribution center in downtown San Diego for five years. And then they asked me to go into sales. And I ended up in sales for another 15 years. Along the way, I married Joy. We had our son, Daniel. He was here last week, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, with our little granddaughter, uh, Naomi, from Philadelphia. So had Joy, had our son, Daniel, I was blessed. Good career. I was blessed. But I was oppressed. I was oppressed by this overwhelming anxiety and worry every day that I was going to leave my family in the same position that our family grew up in. That if something happened to me out on the road, if I got killed and I'd be gone in an instant, then they would have to struggle and I didn't want that, and so I was always worried about that happening. My turning point came through an encounter in this book, in the Bible. Now, I was a lit major in college, literature major, and uh, even after college, even when I was in business, I still liked to read a lot. And when I traveled, my territory was pretty large, ended up pretty large. I was from Disneyland down to the Mexican border, across through Palm Springs to Blythe, down to Yuma, 
And across everything in between that was all my customers, all my territory. So I was on the road a lot. And to help pass the time, this is way before Sirius Radio. You know, to get out in the desert, there were no radio stations I could get. And so I would go to the library and pick up all these books on tape. You remember cassette tapes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And they were wonderful. I would start listening to a book on tape as I was traveling. It was no good. I'd just throw it in the back seat, start the next one, you know, pick up half a dozen at a time. And so I was doing that, and all of a sudden it just dawned on me one day. I considered myself an educated person. I loved to read, but I had never read the most popular book on planet Earth from cover to cover. I thought, well, how's that? How can I call myself educated? I haven't done that. So I got home and said to Joy, hey, we have a Bible here somewhere, don't we? Of course, honey, you know, here you go. And so I started reading it. And I was reading through Genesis, you know, creation of the world and everything, and it was wonderful, calling with Abraham and his family, and, and uh, you know, got through all of that, and then I was listening, uh, reading through Exodus, and that was exciting. I mean, it was great stuff, and all the miracles, and all the different things that happened, and the freeing of God's people, and calling of Moses, and everything. And then I got to this book called Leviticus. Everybody ever read Leviticus? Okay. My immature self at that time started trying to read through that book, and I just couldn't do it. I mean, all this blood and sacrifices and purple robes and rules and all that kind of stuff, and I just went, ugh. And I, and I stopped. And so a few days went by, and I got home one day, and Joyce said, you know, honey, I haven't seen you with your Bible recently. How's it going? And I said, ah, you know, I'm stuck at this, this book called Leviticus. And she said, well, honey... She's a smart one. You'll figure out here pretty quick. She said, I'm sure that they have a Bible on tape at the library. Oh. So I raced down there, and sure enough, they did. They had a Bible on tape. The only one they had was King James Version. Now, I was fine with that. That's what they used when I was growing up. And so I'd heard that a lot. And I'd even studied Shakespeare in college, so a lot of the language was okay. I could understand it. And the wonderful thing about it was couple of wonderful things. One was the narrator was a man named Alexander Scorby, a great Shakespearean actor who had what I call the voice of God. I mean, you know, it's just dropped down through your head. It's like you couldn't help but listen. And he was a fantastic reader. And then the other thing was that even the parts I didn't get, I didn't understand, it would just keep going. And eventually you kind of get things through the context of listening. And it was wonderful. I got through one day, the day of my encounter with Jesus happened. I had finished all of my accounts in the Palm Springs area, ended up in Blythe, had to spend the night there. But <laughs> the next morning, I was going to start calling on my accounts in Yuma. And I had about an hour and a half drive. I would leave at 6.30 in the morning. I wanted to be at my account when they opened at 8 o'clock. And uh, I'd finished the Old Testament that night, that day. I was getting ready to go, and I was overwhelmed with worry for a different reason this time. This particular customer was one of those guys that he didn't particularly like salespeople. He was a big customer of mine, a big customer, spent a lot of money with us. But he always liked to kind of grind in the knife, always kind of work, trying to work a better deal, always claiming he needed something else, always threatening to give his business to somebody else, you know, if he didn't take better care of him. One of those kind of guys... And usually, we were a large distributor. I knew he kind of had to use us. I wasn't overly worried about that usually. But a new competitor had just opened up in Phoenix. It took us two days to get freight from San Diego to Yuma at that time, and it was overnight from Phoenix. I thought, this guy, he's going to leave me, and I'm going to lose that business. I'm going to lose that commission. It's going to be a horrible day. So just to take my mind off of that worry as much as I could, as I started down the highway, I popped in the first book in the New Testament, first tape of the New Testament, listening to Matthew. And so I was listening to Matthew, and again, you know, kind of worried, but, you know, eventually the, the words just started seeping in, and especially when I got to what we call today the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus talking and teaching so many great truths from that part. And so I want to read to you the part that just, saved me, seriously, is in Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to 
I lost my place, sorry about that. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read this passage to you. It's Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry. Oh, well that kind of got my attention. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, could add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry second time saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, the unbelievers, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry, third time, about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Friends, I had to pull over to the side of the road, and I just kept hitting replay on that tape and listening to that passage over and over again. And the next thing I knew, I had tears coming down my face. I was like, what is this? What is going on here? And I stopped and I prayed, I think, the first real prayer of my life, not one of those bedtime prayers or meal prayers that we all do with the kids, but it was a real one. It was a heart-based prayer. And, and I started praying to God, and I really didn't know that much of what to say, except I said, God, I realize, I think what I'm doing wrong here, it says, seek first your kingdom. And I haven't been doing that. I've been seeking my kingdom. And so, God, if you will help me, I don't know how to do this, but I want to seek your kingdom first. And I just ask one thing, if I do that, I commit myself to you. I believe in your son. I fully commit my life to you. And I just ask that you would lift this oppression of worry from my life. And it immediately was. Just relief, just calm, just peace came over me. Like those in the Bible, I had encountered Jesus and I had a new life. I developed a, a great thirst for the Bible. I started to read it seriously, constantly, wanting to know more and more and more about what this book had to say. We, we began attending a, a good Bible teaching church, and I started attending a couple of men's groups. We were studying different books of the Bible, and I felt so inadequate. I was in my early 40s. Most of the guys had been reading the Bible for years and years, and I just felt kind of out of place. And so I asked a friend of mine, where can I go and just really study the Bible? And he sent me to a great seminary in San Diego, Bethel Seminary. I said, seminary, that's where they train preachers and pastors and stuff. I don't, I don't want to do that. That's a crazy job. Who would ever want to be a pastor? Come on. But I went there and I started to study, to learn, would attend classes in between my travels. It was kind of hodgepodge, but I just loved the teaching there, loved the pastors, the, the professors who were the pastors and teachers. And I had no desire enter the ministry until God said, remember your promise? You said, if I relieved you from worry, you would do whatever I told you to do. And what else can you say? But yes, sir. Yes, Father. So I entered the ministry and I ended up in ministry for 20 years, full-time ministry. Four years in San Diego as an associate pastor, and then we accepted a call to Lake Havasu Baptist Church, where we were there for 16 years. By the way, 
for the fisher people here, great fishing in that lake, okay? I mean, they've, they, they've got some bass in that lake. You know, I've caught a few of them, but always put them back, you know, so. In my retirement, one of the things I was determined to do, I, I never learned to play an instrument growing up. Always wanted to. I love music, love music. It was one of the things that drew us to this church. When we came in, the first time we heard the, the worship songs, love, love it. Great, great skills here. I was always kind of jealous about people who could play guitars and different things. And so I went and picked up a, an inexpensive guitar, and I decided I'm going to go ahead and learn that. I'm going to do the YouTube thing, to put it on my iPad, you know, and I put it on in front of me, and I've got my guitar, and, and, and I'm trying to, you know, do what this person's telling me to do. And I quickly realized it's like looking in a mirror. You know, they're like reversed of what you are. I was like, and I'm just kind of a geek, I guess, because I was like, uh, you know, I couldn't figure it out. I got so frustrated, I just put the guitar in a corner, and I said, done with that. About a year went by, and I, I ran across a wonderful guy, a wonderful friend uh, today, and uh, turned out he, had, he was retired. He settled here in Grand. He had been an engineer with Ford in Detroit. And he mentioned one day playing in his band in Detroit. I said, your band, he's about my age. So I said, what well, kind of stuff? Well, it was all the kind of music I grew up with and, you know, Motown and different stuff. And, and I said, well, what did you play? And he said, well, I played guitar. I said, oh, do you ever teach guitar? And he said, yeah, I've taught a whole bunch of people. Do you want to learn? Yeah, I want to learn. And so I started going to his house every Saturday morning. And, you know, we'd spend most of the time just yakking to each other, you know, talking about, you know, old guy talk, you know, remembering the old days, all that kind of stuff. But we just had a great time, and he would te try and teach me some stuff on the guitar. And I got to where I could kind of pick out a few melodies, just, you know, string by string. I could play one string at a time, that kind of thing. And then it got to the point where I was going to learn to play chords. And I found out I've got these really big fingers, and this arthritis, it doesn't help move that great either. And so I could never play a clean chord. I would always be hitting two strings at the same time, and it was like clunk and whack and terrible sounding. And, you know, he'd screw up his face and go like this. And, <laughs> and so it just never worked. And I got so frustrated, I was about to quit. And then just over a year ago, Joy decided to take me to Hawaii for my 70th birthday. And George, I was telling George we were heading over there, and he said, hey, when you're in Hawaii, pick up an ukulele. He says, for a couple of reasons. Number one, he says, it's only four strings. Even you could figure that out, right? <laughs> nice teacher, right? But the other thing he said was, he said, I'm not sure of this. I haven't looked at one closely recently, but he said, I think the strings are just a little bit further apart, and you'll probably be able to play songs a little easier. So we did that. Went to Hawaii, picked up a beautiful baritone ukulele, has a really nice sound to it, and I just started kind of messing around with it, and got home, and George, even though he's a guitar player, he could figure out, he could figure out the ukulele, and he, so he's teaching me some things, and I've been doing that, uh, and, you know, getting a little bit better. You know, I only have two problems, he tells me all the time. He says, you don't have any tightening, and you don't have any rhythm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pastor Brian, is that a problem? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But, you know, I was having fun with it, and I'm having more fun with this instrument anyway. And so I picked up a couple of songbooks, and I started looking at songs that, you know, had chords that I'd already learned. I said, okay, well, maybe I can kind of sound these out. And sure enough, over time, I'd practice and to get a little bit better, a little better. Now, a few weeks ago, actually, as I started preparing this message, I ran across this one song that I remembered well from years ago. It was a cute little song, a, a, a you know, catchy little tune, and it was very popular for a little while. And so I decided to learn the song. And uh, it has kind of a reggae beat to it, and I want to share you just the beginning of it. You'll have to forgive my voice, but I'm going to share this with you anyway. Just the first line of it goes like this. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Oh, Pastor Brian, you've trained the congregation so well. Yeah, you know, Bobby McFerrin, 1988, you know, definitely a one-hit wonder, but that song was everywhere. You couldn't turn on your radio back then, if you remember, without hearing that, and everybody's kind of walking around, you know, don't worry, be happy, right? Well, that's okay, and it was fun, you know, to learn, start learning this song. And then I got to the second line, 
And it actually dawned on me, you know, there's actually some really good theology in here. So let me share with you the second line. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Oh, there's some truth there, isn't there? We'll come back to the first part. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. See, when we worry, worry leads to anxiety and panic and sometimes depression and substance abuse and relational problems, marital problems, all these things that come out of worry. And the first part, in every life we have some trouble. You know, Bobby's actually quoting Jesus here. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. In this world, there's trouble. Truth here? We know this, right? Everybody nodding their heads, of course. Even pastors have trouble. About halfway through our ministry in Lake Havasu in 2010, I had been hard of hearing for a long time. I actually was deaf in the left ear for many years, and the right ear started going down. And they kept boosting it up, giving me more powerful hearing aids and all that. But my audiologist told me, you know, eventually, and my, uh, you know, we visited several surgeons. She said, you're going to need a cochlear implant eventually. So we visited several places, a surgeon here, especially in Phoenix, that we really liked. And, and he said, yeah, you know, when that day comes, when you lose your hearing completely, we'll do the implant. Okay. That day happened, August of 2010. And so Joy contacted their office, and they said, okay, well, we've got to you know, do the insurance thing and all that. It would take a couple of weeks, and then we'll contact you and set up a time to have the surgery. I couldn't hear a thing. You could set off a bomb, and I couldn't hear anything. And so one additional thing came up, one additional trouble. I ended up with a blood clot in my leg. I had to go on blood thinners for six months. I could not have surgery. So they said, well, after you're all done with your six months, we'll test your blood, and if it's okay, we'll start the whole process over again with the insurance or whatnot. I couldn't hear anything. I was totally deaf for nine months. And as a pastor, that was a little bit challenging because my job was communication, talking to people and listening back having a two-way conversation, and I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear myself when I preached. It was, I thought it was impossible to do. And so the, for the first Sunday, we came after that had happened, and we figured out what was going on, and I came up before the congregation. I shared it with them, and I was thinking, well, what's going to happen? You know, they're probably going to fire me, or they're just going to put me on the shelf for nine months, or you know, to set me aside and get somebody else, and you know, hopefully they'll let me come back. I didn't know what was going to happen. The elders came forth, and they laid hands on me, and they prayed over me. And one of them looked at me in the face, and I could kind of read lips by them pretty well, and, and he pointed at me, and he said, You are a pastor. You keep preaching. We will keep listening. Whew. That was a moment, a powerful moment in my life. A God moment. And somehow, God allowed me to preach without being able to hear even myself for nine months. To teach for those nine months until I had the implant done. God is so good. So good. Now, Bobby and Jesus have two different answers to this problem that we will have trouble in this world. Bobby's answer is this. Don't worry. Be happy. Well, okay, <laughs> that sounds good, but how do you just do that? How do we just be happy? Well, Jesus, of course, has a better answer. He says, reminds us, yes, in this world you will have trouble, but, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome this world. We're on a temporary journey on this fallen earth, right? Now, as I look around, I think most of us are in the same place I am. Most people, a few younger ones, but most of us are in the second half of life, right? Most of us are closer to eternity than we've ever been. We all are closer to eternity than we've ever been. Um, I loved Pastor Jim's recent series. Actually, when we first started attending the church, he did a great series on heaven. Whew. 
powerful. If you missed it, make sure you watch it online. It's excellent. Great reminders of what heaven's going to be like. But meanwhile, we're here. Meanwhile, we're here in this world, this fallen world, and there's trouble. But Jesus says, don't worry. You know, psychologists have done studies on worry. And they would talk to people who were younger and, you know, and, and have them write out everything that they were worried about, everything that were their major concerns. And then they would touch base with them every few years. And they'd say, okay, we want you to revise your list. You know, any things you're not worried about anymore, any things you have added, and guess what? You know, usually there are more worries, right? They come up in life, different things happen. And so they track these for decades. And then they would come to the end and they would do this spreadsheet. They'd check everything out. And here's what they found out that's amazing to me. 95% of what people were worried about never happens. Never happens. Why do we spend all of that energy, all of that angst on worrying about things that will never occur, will never happen? So Jesus says, don't worry. Instead, verse 33, seek God's kingdom first. Seek God's kingdom first. Jesus freed me from overwhelming anxiety and worry. What about you? What about you today? Are you worried? Are you feeling oppressed with worry? Or are you seeking God's kingdom? Have you encountered Jesus do you want to go to heaven? You know, as a pastor, I never met anybody that told me they didn't want to go to heaven. You know, a lot of them just thought, well, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. You know, so that's a whole other discussion. That's a whole other message for another day. But, but one of the things, if you want to go to heaven, and we all do, you must encounter Jesus. He was clear in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's the only way. Well, you, you might be asking, well, okay, how does that happen? How can, how can I make that happen? Does that just happen? Well, Jesus said a little bit later, and actually in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, and he's talking metaphorically here about the door to the heart, he says, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. He's talking about fellowship. He's talking about an encounter with him. Paul added in the book of Romans, the letter he wrote to the Roman church, he said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will go to heaven. It's a promise. It's God's promise. But you must believe. Jesus is knocking. You must believe, you must declare, you must say it. The big question today, have you encountered Jesus? Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for this church. Thanks for allowing Joy and I to find this wonderful place where the preaching is so real and the Bible matters. So I thank you, Father, for this day. I thank you for everyone's attention. And I just pray, Lord, that something that's been said this morning might help someone. I pray that anyone who doesn't have a personal relationship with your son, Jesus, would open their heart today and would receive him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mike. So that passage in John 14, 6, <clears throat> that was actually put to music back in 2019. We did it last week. It's called The Way. That's how we're going to conclude our service today, by singing these great words. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every surge, I believe you 
simply to declare these words together. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to, but they can't stay long when I It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to. set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to but they can't stay our prayer encouragers to come stand at the foot of the cross. Pastor Mike is going to come back and, and give us our invitation. If God has moved in your heart today and you have things that you want prayer for or to pray about, I invite you to come over here and uh, God will do business with you. Mike. For our closing benediction today, I wanted to share it. Some more words from Jesus, again from chapter 14 of John. The situation is that Jesus had just told his disciples he was leaving. He was going back to heaven. They were upset. They were worried. He promised them, though, that I'm going to send a comforter. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And then he said to them these words, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Friends, go in peace. Have a blessed day.